Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Tom Segev, a historian and a columnist for Haaretz in Israel. His new book is The Life and Legends of Simon Wiesenthal. Tom, welcome back to our program. Thank you. Uh, why a biography of uh, Simon Wiesenthal? What, what are the circumstances, what are the, the, the circumstances under which you decided to do the biography? Well, uh, about five years after he, uh, sh shortly after he died five years ago at the age of 97, I went to the tiny office in Vienna where he had worked for nearly 45 years. And um, I went there to see if there was anything I could add to the many books which he had written and uh, written about him. And uh, I found about 300,000 uh, documents and I immediately realized that all the other books contain only what he wanted us to know, but there are lots and lots of other things. And I, as I was still thinking, should I do this or not, I took out a file just by coincidence from 1945, immediately after Wiesenthal had been f liberated from the fifth of the concentration camps where he had been, the camp of Mauthausen in Austria. And I saw in the file a man who really doesn't know what to do with himself. These were personal records, medical records. He weighed 40 kilos. He believed that his wife it was gone. It later turned out that she survived, but he didn't know it then. And um, this is a man who has no future, and he really looks like the pictures of survivors, which we all know, a walking skeleton. And I walked along the shelf and took out a file from the 1980s, again, just to see what is there. And my eyes fell uh, upon a letter in English that said, Simon Darling, we take care of yourself. We need you. We love you. And it was signed by Elizabeth Taylor. And so I thought, wow, this is really a very dramatic framework for somebody who starts from the lowest of the low and works himself up to become a moral authority respected all over the world. And so that's when I really decided uh, to do the books. And then I went on reading more and more and more and more among these thousands of documents. And of course, I found out many more things that surprised me. And, and it, w it, was a, it was a nice fit for you, given the, the historical studies that you had done previously. And you, you were trained as a historian in Boston yes. and, and had studied psychohistory, as I recall. Yes, my uh, PhD in history is a uh, collective profile of commanders of Nazi concentration camps. And so I had worked on Nazi criminals, and I um, worked on survivors and on the politics of memory in Israel. This is my book, The Seventh Million. And um, so I thought that these books had uh, really prepared me to do the biography of Wiesenthal. And, and these files you were looking at were in the three offices that were his uh, base of operation uh, in Vienna. This is a really tiny office. It has three tiny rooms. And this is where he had worked for mm, so many years. It is packed, fully packed with files, thousands and thousands of files, so many of them that you can hardly walk through in, in the rooms from one room to the other. And on one of the walls, there is a huge map of Europe that uh, indicates the locations of hundreds of Nazi concentration camps. Wiesenthal was prisoner in five concentration camps. And most of these files contain names of Nazi criminals whom uh, he searched for and, and hoped to bring to justice. And um, there are also many thousands of, of, of files that uh, reflect his own personal life. Your, your book is subtitled The Life and Legends of Simon Wiesenthal. Right. And, and 
for you as a historian, that <clears throat> must have been a major challenge. I mean, that 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 that's an insightful uh, uh, description of what you're about and what he was about. So what are the particular problems for a historian where you have to separate the, the reality from the legend? When I started to work on this book, Simon Wiesenthal had already been a mythological figure. And so the first task was to see how much of what we know about him is myth and how much is reality. Now Wiesenthal was a man who tended to live between uh, reality and, and fantasy. He was a man who sometimes rewrote his biography, actually wrote his autobiography three times, and they are all different from each other. And uh, not everything he said was true, but it was for me not catching him lying, but really trying to understand why are there discrepancies between things which he tells again and again and again. And so that was quite difficult. For example, he pretended to head an office that was uh, as powerful as the power of the KGB, the CIA, and the Mossad together. In reality, he worked in these three tiny little offices, going through old Nazi documents and, and address books and old newspapers and old telephone books, trying to locate the whereabouts of these people. And the reason why he pretended to be that powerful was, of course, because that way uh, various authorities in, in, in several countries uh, respected him. When he would address a minister of justice anywhere and said, you need to take this guy and put him on trial, they would think that this is the powerful Simon Wiesenthal. In reality, he was only as powerful as the myth. And uh, this is why he developed this myth. But there were other things which he, which um, turned out to be inaccurate, and I made an effort in the book to analyze why this is. I don't belong to those Wiesenthal bashers, and there are many who uh, said that Wiesenthal was a liar. He was not a liar. He, uh, there is a reason why for each, uh, each time he says something which is not accurate, there is a reason why he does that. And, uh, that was, to me, very, very challenging uh, to do. And, and let's, uh, in a nutshell, uh, identify his contribution. He was uh, the preeminent Nazi hunter who really kept uh, the narrative of the Holocaust alive That's right. during a period when governments were not interested. Right. He, by the way, hated the term Nazi hunter. And also I reached the conclusion in, in my book that although he acted as a Nazi hunter, he was in fact haunted by his past and by the Holocaust, and he could never rid himself of, of that. So he was more haunted than hunter. But uh, yes, I think his major contribution is his commitment to memory, to Holocaust memory. And I think he did more than anybody else to preserve memory. Memory to Simon Wiesenthal was not merely a commitment to the dead, but it was a tool to prevent further genocides and war crimes. The Holocaust for Simon Wiesenthal was primarily a crime against humanity, against the Jews as part of humanity, but it was a crime against humanity. So he had this worldwide humanistic universal approach to the Holocaust. He, uh, let, let's talk a little about his background, and then uh, I want to walk you through the characteristics that made him uh, so successful at what he was trying to do. He, he was born in, Pol in Galicia, uh, yes. which was part of Poland at one time. Right. Or? It's today part of the Ukraine. Right. And what was his profession? He and was born in, in a little town called Buchach, where also the Israeli author Shai Agnon was born. And uh, he studied architecture. He graduated from high school, studied architecture, married, and probably expected to be part of the Jewish community of Poland and work as a Jewish architect in Poland. But then World War II broke out. The Nazis invaded Poland. And he was sent from one camp to the other, altogether five. And after the war, he never returned to his profession. 
uh, as an architect. He was liberated from Camp Mauthausen in May of 1945. And the amazing thing is that within 10 days, he was able to hand over to the American occupation forces a list of over 100 names and said to the Americans, these are the people I want you to look and bring to justice. So this is so amazing because you have to imagine the, the survivor of a concentration camp. I mean, where does the paper come from? Where does the ink come from? Where does the, where does the information come from? Where does the peace of mind come from to prepare such a list? So I think that he must have thought about that while he was still a prisoner in the, in the camps. And it is very possible that the, the thought that uh, these terrible people will be brought to justice one day may have made it easier for him to endure what he had to endure. And uh, this is what he did for, for the rest of his life. For the next 60 years, he prepared lists of names and wanted people brought to justice. And, and early in, one of, in your narrative, uh, he, he's ad identifying a, a criminal act or some outrageous incident and finding the name of the person who committed and, and hence the list that you just described. So, so he really, he, he, he came to this situation with a sense of both the responsibility of the individual who was yeah. doing it and the notion that somewhere out there justice would be had. Right. A, there is no such thing as collective guilt. We really have to find the person who did it. And uh, B, he believed in the liberal system of justice, which is ironic because the liberal system of justice proved to be inadequate for this type of, uh, of crimes. Most Nazi criminals were acquitted because that's the way the system is. But still, he believed in justice, and for Wiesenthal, it was always about justice, never revenge. He did not want to see people killed in a dark alley somewhere. He wanted them brought to justice. A fellow survivor once came to him and uh, shared a plan with him to kidnap the three sons of Adolf Eichmann and drown them in a lake. And Wiesenthal said, not me. That's not the way Jews do things. We don't drown children in the, in the lake. We look for the criminal and bring him to justice. And in fact, Eichmann was, of course, the major obsession for Wiesenthal, the, the the big thing for him was, was to locate him. What do and you, he did. <clears throat> we'll talk about that in a minute, what do you attribute, to what do you attribute his survival in the camps? Was it that he was entrepreneurial, that he was lucky, or a combination of other things? He was lucky. There, mm -hmm. is, no, there is no other explanation. Some people survived. He must have been stronger. That particular day, he may have died the next day had the Americans not come. So it really had no significance and no meaning, and that was something which disturbed him very much, and he kept looking for the meaning of his survival. So he invented stories that, that made the circumstances of his survival much more dramatic in order to give them some kind of miraculous meaning. The, the, the search for meaning, why did I survive, was something that disturbed him very much, and he would not accept the fact that he just survived, just like others did not. Uh, I want to show your book again, and I like the cover very much. And uh, the reason I want to show the cover is, <clears throat> as you describe Wiesenthal and what he did, one part of his uh, persona was he was a very good private detective. <laughs> he worked like a researcher, really. Yeah. He hated the term Nazi hunter, and he described himself as a researcher, and that is what he did. In that tiny little office, he spent most of his time, as I said, going through documents and, and old newspapers and locating names, uh, marking them, um, and cutting things out of newspapers. I sometimes thought that the major weapon really was the scissors in his hand and put them away. And remember that he did that at a time when there were no computers. It was all in his head. He had a fantastic <coughs> memory. And um, um, so it's a quite, quite, quite un unusual, unusual uh, story how he gathered thousands of names of people. Not all of them were, of course, ever brought to trial. So in a way, he also lived from one 
disappointment to the other. From one file he had to close to the other because the guy was not caught, was not located, or was caught, or not arrested, or not brought to trial, or if he was brought to trial, he was not, he was not uh, uh, convicted, and uh, if, if he was uh, sentenced to some imprisonment, he would be released very soon. This was a time when nobody was interested in, in war crime, in, 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 in trials of, of war criminals, and, and Simon Wiesenthal was all alone. He, he, that, that's something that makes his, his activity very, very heroic in a, in, in a way. His commitment to, to, to his sense of justice is something which I uh, admire very much. And a, another component uh, of his style was theatrical, a, a sense of publicity, yes. the sense of using the media yes. uh, to, to keep the story alive. Right. He was a great uh, manipulator of, of, uh, of the media. He also liked the publicity. He was a vain person. He liked being in, in the news. So that's human. But um, he used the media in order to advance his own work. And that's uh, interesting about it. Because whenever he would be on television, he gets a lot of phone calls and letters from people who give him bits and pieces of information. Sometimes they don't, these bits and pieces don't lead anywhere. Uh, some people in Germany want to get rid of their neighbors, so they write to Simon Wiesenthal, our neighbor was an SS officer or something <laughs> like that. But sometimes uh, these uh, hints did lead somewhere. And what is also very important is the fact that as a result of his fame, survivors approached him. And so he was able to compile lists of survivors according to places where they had been imprisoned. And so when a, a prosecuting authority somewhere in Germany or in Austria was preparing a trial, they would approach him and say, we are preparing a trial about uh, a ghetto somewhere, but we have no witnesses. Maybe you have a witness. And he would say, yes, there is a witness somewhere. In, Hadera, Israel, or in Cleveland, Ohio, or in Berkeley, California, and uh, yes, I know, I know exactly the, your, your men. So that was not less important than the, than the uh, lists of criminals. As you describe this, and listening to you lecture at noon, I was struck by his insight into what we call social networks now with computers. In other words, he was creating, without computers, right. a social network no and, a, and, a, and a constituency right. for a crime which governments didn't want to recognize. Right. This is all private enterprise. This is a one-man operation against powerful forces who wanted to prevent him. From, from doing that. The Austrian government obviously wasn't interested. The German government wasn't interested. The US government wasn't interested in war trials because they needed Germany as an ally in the Cold War. And so he was completely alone, except for survivors and volunteers and also people, especially here in America, who sent donations to him, which were helpful to, by the way, very small ones. This is interesting, $10, $15. And he answered almost every, every letter personally. Every, every donation, he would, he would send a thank you letter. So somebody sent him a $10 donation and now has a thank you letter from Wiesenthal. It might, worth, might be worth more than, than the $10 which, which he sent him. So, <laughs> This is, uh, you're right, this is the network. And one survivor told him about other survivors. And so he really concentrated all this and it was all in his head, no computer. He had an unbelievably fantastic memory. And, and so the, the, the legend, the building of the legend is very important in this context. But then on the other hand, the spreading of both information and misinformation does, is functional for his operation. So he, he, he can say uh, 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 Mengele, the doctor in the concentration camps, right. was spotted somewhere. He holds a press right. conference. And even if he doesn't know that to be true, right. that, it then that generates. Is, uh, that's true. That's true. That, this is exactly what, what, uh, what happened. And, and, and there is a book out by, by people called Posner, who, which is a biography of, of Mengele. Mengele was the doctor in Auschwitz. 
and they kind of make fun of Wiesenthal because uh, Mengele was long dead and Wiesenthal would still call press conference and say, I know that he's in Paraguay or in Uruguay or in Chile or wherever. And when, we, when Wiesenthal read this book, he wrote a really moving letter to them in which he said, no, I, I had no idea where Mengele was. But the CIA had no idea, the Mossad had no idea, the, no, nobody knew where Mengele is, no, nobody knew whether he is alive or dead, but I'm the only one who kept his name in the news. At least people kept searching for him. So I thought this is a very moving kind of thing, saying, no, I, it, it's like saying I, I, uh, I misled the press. I, I really didn't know if he's in Paraguay or not, but I claimed because I needed his name because I needed the file to remain open. This, is, uh, this was his way of manipulating the media. And, and he seems to have had uh, insight and an intuitive understanding of people. I think at some point you say that as an architect, he, he thought about people and, and where they might want to live and so on. So, so the, the, there's something right. that he- Right, was, he was interested in people. Yes, yeah. he was interested in people. He had. But he was a very lonely man. He, he had many admirers and many enemies and very few friends. So he was also, he, he did not only work alone, he was only a, also a lone, lonely, lonely character. But yes, he was very interested in people, in the stories of people. And it is true that while he uh, was active in a, in a, in a construction firm in, before the war, he always thought, I wonder who will ever live in these, in these rooms and, and, and homes. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, the, the building of the legend really worked because he was played a number of times in the movie. And in fact, right. in, the, in the, uh, uh, the movie, uh, The Boys of Rio. Of Brazil. Of uh, Brazil, yes. right. He was played right. by, uh, by Laurence Olivier. Right, and he hated the film. Mm -hmm. He hated the book because he was right. It's a rubbish book and it's a rubbish film. But uh, he said, like, when Laurence Olivier knocks on your door and says, I want to play you, well, who am I to tell you no? Yes, play me. <laughs> but Ben Kingsley played him and Jer Derek Jacoby uh, played him. So he was very popular in, and there are the, 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 the Odessa file, of course, and, and uh, and I think he best liked uh, Ben Kingsley playing him in, in a biographical film about him. This is not a feature film. And so, yes, he became very, very famous. He became actually a cultural hero in, in America. And he felt very, very much at home in, in, in America. And he, he was very grateful to America for having liberated Camp Mauthausen. It was as if the entire war effort of the U.S. Army was directed only at his personal liberation. He, he in fact, felt so grateful to America that he wrote a little book in which he tried to prove that Columbus was Jewish. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> it wasn't such a great success. And, and um, he, he, but, but he was very, very popular in, in America. Three U.S. presidents invited him to the White House. And he got the Congressional Medal and uh, endless number of, of honorary doctorates from almost every university in, in Let, let's, let's talk about his identity, because he, you, you said at noon today that he, he had four circles of identity. Right. And, and it's, a, it's a very complex story in a way. Right. And talk, talk a little about that. He, he, was, he, he, lived, saw, yeah. he, he lived in four circles of identity. The major circle of identity was, was the Jewish, his Jewish origins. He understood himself first and foremost to be Jewish and he, uh, he looked Jewish and he thought Jewish and, and, uh, and every language he spoke sounded like Yiddish. So that was, that was the major circle of, of identity. Then uh, he very much regarded himself as an Austrian patriot, which is uh, why he stayed in, in, uh, in Austria. Many people asked him, why don't you live in Israel? And he always said, I don't live in Israel because there are not enough Nazis to hunt in Israel. <laughs> but he stayed in Austria because he felt at home there. His father was killed in World War I wearing an Austrian uniform, and Austria had always been home to him, and so he stayed there, which is kind of 
difficult to understand for a Holocaust survivor. And, and in fact, it was very, very difficult for, for his wife and for his daughter to live in Austria. They begged him, let's, let's get out of this terrible country, but he remained there. And uh, the uh, third circle of identity was Israel. He was a very ardent Zionist. He loved Israel. He identified with Israel. He supported Israel. He did a lot to support the uh, is Israeli uh, uh, public relations in the world and, and wrote articles and, and so on. And as I said, the fourth uh, circle of identity was, was here in America. He, he really felt very much at home here in America and he was very well received for some reason. This is why I mentioned Elizabeth Taylor at the beginning. For some reason, at the uh, movie industry, he was popular with the movie industry. Uh, Frank Sinatra sang "My Way" for him, and and uh, other actors. And and uh, um, uh, Jackie Mason once interrupted a, a show and said, "I see in the audience Simon Wiesenthal, things like that." So. Um, uh, uh, Hollywood loved him, but not only. As, as I say, academic, the, the universities gave him honorary doctorates. And I think that this belongs to a time when the United States began to discover the Holocaust and to make it part of the intellectual identity of, of America, which is, which is not only a Jewish thing, it's really part of, 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 of the intellectual identity of, of, of all Americans, the Holocaust. You, you say at one point he took pains to belong and not belong at the same time. To Austria. Yeah, to right. Austria. Right, so because it wasn't easy to, to be a Simon Wiesenthal in, in, uh, in Austria. I sometimes even thought, why do the Austrians even, even deserve Simon Wiesenthal? But it wasn't easy. And so he could always say, well, I work for American organizations such as the Joint and ORT, which he did. At his first 15 years in, in Austria, he could always say, I'm, I belong to Israel. Um, the Austrians didn't know it, but he actually worked for, for the Mossad. He was financed by the Israeli Mossad for, for a while. And by the way, now that the Austrians heard about it, they were very, this is, that came out of my book, a big, big headline, first in the New York Times and then in other countries. And, and in Austria, they said, aha, he was a spy. He was an agent. He wasn't one of ours at all. And so um, it was very difficult to, to, to be a Simon Wiesenthal in, in Austria. And uh, this is why he kind of always said to himself, well, I live with one leg in, in Israel, with one leg in America. I have alternatives. You cite a case where the Mossad and Israelis approached him about uh, cleaning the record of a right. former SS right. man who right. they wanted to use for operations right. in the Middle East. And this, it's an interesting story because he, he was committed to a set of values. And what was his answer to them? That is, uh, that is interesting indeed because uh, many countries employed former Nazis and the United States employed former Nazis. Wiesenthal would often come to the CIA and tell them, I know where this or that uh, criminal is, and the CIA would tell him, thank you very much, he already works for us, find us another one. And one day, a very senior official of the Mossad, the Israeli Mossad, came to Wiesenthal and said, the State of Israel needs your help. We have uh, the agreement of a former SS officer who knows a lot about German scientists working in Egypt on a rock missile program. Um, by the name of Otto Skotseni, and he is willing to work for us. But he has one condition. He works for us if you strike his name from the list of your wanted criminals. And so Wiesenthal was in real dilemma, being a big supporter of Israel, and uh, he had two sleepless nights. And at the end, he looked the Mossad official in the eyes and said, uh, no, no, no way. He is a Nazi criminal, and he will remain on my list. You, your earlier book, The, uh, the Seventh uh, Million, uh, focuses on how Israel's thinking changed about the Holocaust. And a pivotal point in that history is the Eichmann trial. Yes. And 
Simon Wiesenthal was one of four very important yes. persons in locating uh, Eichmann. Yes. Yes. Uh, talk about his involvement because it, it, there's a it's a it's a it's a narrative in which for quite a while he was sifting through the evidence. He located him many years earlier, but right. no one was interested in going after him. Right, Wiesenthal was able to. Uh, informed the Israeli government in Vienna as early as 1953 that Eichmann was living in Argentina. Eichmann was the major criminal which he really, really wanted to locate because Eichmann for the Jews was the Holocaust. There were two Adolfs, Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler and Adolf Eichmann. And um, he informed the Israeli government as early as 1953, and nothing happened, because in those days, Israelis didn't know how to deal with the Holocaust. The Holocaust was taboo in Israel, and, and uh, parents wouldn't tell their children about it, and children wouldn't dare to ask, and the Israeli secret services did not put it very high on the list of their priorities, because Israel was a very future-oriented country and had other worries, other things to worry about, rather than uh, chasing old Nazis, but Wiesenthal continued, and there were four other, they, they, altogether there were four Holocaust survivors, one of them was Wiesenthal, one of them was uh, a man called Tuvia Friedman, who is still alive, who lives in Israel, a very old man. One of them was a German Jewish prosecutor by the name of Bauer, who lived in Frankfurt, and he's the one who received the information a second time towards the 1960s and gave it to Israel, and again, Israel was not quick to act on it. And the fourth one was actually a Holocaust survivor who lived in Argentina and one day found out that the uh, boyfriend of his girl is, of, of, of his daughter, is, is, the, um, is the son of Eichmann. And so he's saving Eichmann's son, yeah. He, yeah. Right. And so he, he, uh, he approached Israel and he approached Germany and said, well, this is where he is. Just go and get him. And it took a long time. So in... Israeli popular memory, the uh, abduction of Eichmann by Israeli agents in 1960 is considered an act of heroism, mm, heroic Mossad. And to me, uh, it's not really a big deal. I mean, that's what Mossad agents are trained to do. They, they, uh, they uh, lifted him off the street. Uh, he was unarmed. He came home from work. So, so they snatched him and brought him to Israel. The, it's not such a heroic thing to do, but the heroic thing to do is to insist that this is the right thing to do. And this is really, um, so, so it's not a story of, of Israeli heroism so much as it is a story of Jewish commitment. And, and, and so Wiesenthal really, as I said earlier, he kept the narrative uh, of the Holocaust alive until this point right. at which the Eichmann trial and the verdict and all the testimony right. open, opens up the world to, to sort of look back at this and history. And also opens Israel up. Israel, the, the Holocaust really starts to become part of the Israeli identity with the Eichmann trial, as, as it is today, a very major part of the Israeli identity is the Holocaust. And uh, following the Eichmann trial, also the... the, um, the uh, Israeli Mossad changed its priorities a little bit, and that's when they began to employ Wiesenthal. And from that time on, you can say that Wiesenthal was an Israeli Mossad agent, but uh, when they were so happy about it in Austria, as I mentioned before, because they said, aha, he's a, he's a spy, I went to Austria and told them that uh, they got it all wrong. It's not that Wiesenthal worked for the Mossad. In reality, the Mossad worked for Wiesenthal because all they did was to give him money to do what he had been doing 15 years before, recognizing that it is a, a um, that they, they are part of that Jewish commitment of, of, of Wiesenthal to locate Nazis and bring them to justice. I mean, this is so amazing that um, Wiesenthal was even needed, that the governments didn't do it on their own, but he really did something which governments refused to do. The, there's a... a, a, a coming together of this whole issue of his identity and then how he saw the problem he was addressing. And what I have in mind here as a Jew, you know, uh, Jews are always caught in this conflict between being very focused on the Jewish people 
and uh, a, a provincial, a more provincial outlook versus Jews as very cosmopolitan and committed to universal values. And in his views uh, uh, with regard to the Holocaust, he, as you said earlier, he maintained the importance of seeing the Holocaust as uh, a crime against humanity and right. not just a crime against the right. Jews. So he was interested in other groups which Nazis uh, um, persecuted, the uh, gypsies, the mentally ill, the gays, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and he also did not hesitate to compare the Holocaust with other genocides which happened after the war in Rwanda, in Cambodia. He once says that when he sees the picture of the famous picture of the boy who raises his hand of the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, he sees a hungry boy in Cambodia, whereupon he received a very angry letter from Elie Wiesel, because Elie Wiesel represented the exact opposite approach to the Holocaust. For Elie Wiesel, the Holocaust was a crime against the Jews, period. For Wiesenthal, the Holocaust was a crime against all of humanity. So this is a very, very different approach to the Holocaust. And in his papers and also in the book, I quote uh, a very extensive correspondence between the two on this. Uh, it's really a matter, as you said, uh, of universalism versus uh, narrow Jewish view. And uh, this is a this is a fantastic. Uh, Correspondent was really interesting, and so I have I have that in the book. Mm -hmm. And and I, I'm curious, there is no mention in your book, uh, and and this is not meant as a criticism, but it's a comment on Wiesenthal. There's no mention of the United Nations, for example, or seeking redress in an international court. There w there wasn't an international court yet, but he but did do what he did do was, I think, to, he was instrumental in the international uh, police, the Interpol. Ah, he I did, see. He, he, he worked for Interpol. I think that this was probably a little bit earlier, but the UN, he, he definitely, he even spoke at the UN. He, he was invited to address the, the well, General uh, Assembly. I guess what I'm trying to say is that he sought redress in the court systems of nation states. That's right. Yeah. Basically, and, yes. International and, and it, law was very new, and mm -hmm. and Nuremberg was no good. He yeah. thought, and and and, so. and which which is a, a a comment again on on the remarkable achievement uh, that was his. Uh, but he worked, for example, for uh, extending the statute of limitations. So he yes, he really would much. work these national systems very to make things so. happen. Very much so. In 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 Germany, this was a worldwide campaign which was very successful, which he led from that little office in in, uh, in Vienna, single-handedly writing letters to statesmen and intellectuals and all that, and organizing this huge campaign which eventually worked, because otherwise uh, in Germany and then also in Austria, people, it, it would be impossible to bring Nazi criminals to trial. An, an important theme that you work on in the book is is the problem of guilt, and the the you you analyze his actions in terms of the feelings of somebody who was in the Holocaust but survived. Uh, uh, talk a little about that, and the, uh, and, and this is not unrelated to the fact that his survival was due in part to two Germans yes. who, who had helped him. Yes, two decent Germans helped him. I suggest in the book, the question is, of course, why did he do what he did? Why was he so committed? Why couldn't he get rid of his past? And I suggest in the book that he, not unlike other Holocaust survivors, was um, suffering from a very, very strong guilt feeling. He felt guilty for having survived. He felt guilty for having survived due to the decency of two Germans. He felt guilty for having suffered less than others. And uh, this led him even to maximize his suffering to equalize it to thus, to, to, to the suffering of those people who suffered most, even though he, he for example, uh, as I said, he was, he was held in five camps, which is a lot. I mean, it's enough, but he would say that he was in seven or in nine or in 11. 
And so to me that's kind of sad. Why do you need to say that you were in 11 camps if you were in, if you were in five? And, and, and the answer is that he felt so guilty about having suffered less that he kind of tried to, and I think that he believed in it. He, this was not lying. This was really dealing with his past. And so he kind of believed that uh, he, he had actually been in, in, in 11 camps. And so um, this is a book which is very much about the meaning of, of survival and, and, uh, and about the psychology of, of survivors. Is, is the, the punishment of those he finds part of this process of getting rid of not his guilt for the crimes that co were committed against them, but his personal guilt, is he, is he mixing it? Uh, no, I think that uh, this is part of his humanistic uh, worldview, that uh, he doesn't believe in collective guilt. There is no such thing as, as the Germans are guilty. He wants every person to know exactly what crime it is, and it has to be proven in court. And if it's not because the system is inadequate of doing it, then what can I do? That's the system. That's the system he believed in. There was no better system, but it was always about a specific crime which you, sh you and, and, and we have to prove it in, in court. It's not about you being German. It's not even about you being a Nazi. Uh, we really need to know what you did and we need to prove it. So that's a very, very, I think, um, humanistic um, um, attitude and, and, and that kind of surprised me, but it is part of his universal attitude to the Holocaust in general. And, and he wrote a book, The Sunflower. Tell yeah. us a little about that, because it's really about what uh, is his responsibility to forgive right. a German. The Sunflower is the story of uh, a incident which happened to him, he says where he was with a group of other prisoners doing some work in a military hospital and uh, one of the nurses calls him up the third floor and takes him into a room where an, a, a wounded soldier is, is lying and an SS uh, man and he's about to die from his wounds and uh, he says that he cannot die in peace before he uh, seeks forgiveness from a Jew. And so he tells uh, Wiesenthal a terrible, terrible story about Jews who have been driven into a house and the house was set on fire. And um, he then says, I cannot die in peace, I need your forgiveness. And Wiesenthal gets up and leaves the room without forgiving him. And then he wrote up the story and sent it to leading statesmen and intellectuals of his time and asked them, what would you have done? And he got very interesting discussion going about forgiving and, and the duty and the right to forgive. For example, am I forgiving you as Simon Wiesenthal or am I forgiving you as a Jew? Do I have the right to forgive you as a Jew? Do I forgive you in the name of other, other victims and so on? So this is a very complicated and moral and ethical discussion which uh, um, is quite popular in, in American schools. Many, many uh, children in, in American schools read that book and are required to say, what would I have done? And uh, many of them sent their, um, their, their responses to Wiesenthal. There are, there are thousands of, of uh, very nice childish handwriting. Dear Simon, I think that you were right. Or dear Simon, I think that you should have forgiven or not forgiven. Or so. This is um, um, Simon Wiesenthal who deals with the very basic questions of, of the Holocaust. Just as he tried to formulate universal lessons of the Holocaust, he also deals with the nature of evil, the nature of crime, the nature of, the, of forgiveness, and all these things uh, preoccupy them. And, and he actually uh, took up a correspondence uh, with Albert Speer okay. uh, later in his life. Talk a little about that because this, this, this is was a, a kind very, of... very, very, very difficult uh, story. Albert Speer was the Minister of Ammunition in Hitler's government. After the war he was sentenced to, I think, 20 or 25 years imprisonment. And when he got out of prison, 
he made a great effort to rewrite his biography and present himself as, 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 as a good German. And he one day wrote a letter to Simon Wiesenthal and asked him, uh, can I come and visit you? Now it is clear why Albert Speer needs the uh, company of, of, uh, of Wiesenthal. He made great efforts to get in touch with Jewish organizations and, and uh, even with, uh, with Israel. But um, why did Simon Wiesenthal need Speer? And that's, I think you will have to read the book to find out because it's a very, very uh, complicated story to finish in, in, in two words. But the fact is that a really close friendship developed between the victim and the perpetrator. And at one point, the victim identifies with the perpetrator. And uh, I think that this is also part of the very, very deep uh, sense of guilt which Wiesenthal carried with him because he identifies with Speer uh, like a sinner to another sinner. And in one of his letters he writes to him, we all made mistakes in our youth. So that's quite amazing. How can you possibly write such a sentence to the best friend of, of Hitler? But So this is really uh, perhaps the most amazing thing to me to, to discover in the archive of Wiesenthal. What, what do you see as the, the factor or factors that made Wiesenthal such an extraordinary figure? For example, did, was there a library? Did his philosophical insights come from things that he had read? Or was it his focus on what had happened in, in Europe? Well, first of all, he was more of a detective than a philosopher. He, if, if you want to find inconsistencies and, and bad, bad argumentations and things, then go to his, his philosophical writings because that was not really his thing. He, he, he wrote a lot and, and, and philosophized a lot, but that was not really what he did. He was a detective. He was a researcher. He put one uh, one fact to the other, and he collected all these facts. And I'm saying collected because he was also a very, very passionate stamp collector. So I think it's the mentality of the collector which perhaps um, made him do all, the, all these things with such uh, passion. Just as you collect stamps, you collect names and dates and, and, uh, and facts. So um, I, I, I think that he was, he, he, that, that's, uh, that's the more important thing, but uh, he read a lot and uh, he was interested in the basic questions of, of the Holocaust. And in fact, the story of his life involves very basic uh, issues such as the nature of evil and the nature of the Holocaust and, and Holocaust lessons and so on. Uh, and, and finally, final question, what, what did you learn from this exercise and, and what surprised you the most? I was uh, surprised by a number of facts, as we mentioned, the fact that he worked for the Mossad, the fact that he was a, such a close friend of Albert Speer. But I think that what impressed me most was his contribution to memory. It's not about how many criminals he caught or what mistakes he made in his life. I think that uh, the important thing is that uh, he did so much for Holocaust memory. Memory for him was not only a moral commitment to the dead, but it was a tool in the struggle against further genocides and war crimes. And I think that there is no other individual who did more for Holocaust memory than Simon Wiesenthal. On that note, uh, uh, Tom, let me show your book again, because you know, in an hour there's a limit to uh, uh, what we can cover. And, and it's, this book is pa packed full with narratives that, that are quite interesting. Thank you for uh, Thank coming you very back, much. and we'll, we'll have you on the program again when you write your next book. Uh, it's already a tradition for us. Yes, okay. very good. Thank, thank you. you very much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.